giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. For just a buck, you can be our boss at patreon.com forward slash fun FRC. Pledge your support in September and you'll be eligible to win a Cooler Master MS120 keyboard and mouse set. Yeah, so as you guys know, the 2018-2019 FTC game Robo Ruckus was, re was released last week. And with it, new ideas, strategy, and game mechanics are running wild. Tonight, we'll break down some strategy behind the game. First up, let's talk about how you score points this year. Yeah, let's start uh, with the course of the autonomous period. We're not going to spend a ton of time because hopefully you guys have seen this, but we want to get Danny's kind of reactions to the game, especially... Uh, having the field design perspective for that as well, too. Uh, so a autonomous mode, uh, each robot can score uh, up to uh, 80 points. Uh, this year in auto, starting off, each robot can earn uh, 30 points by starting just by latch. I thought that was kind of funny, actually. You just get points essentially by latch, and then you can just stumble and fall, right? And you get points for that. Uh, so this is the first year we've seen uh, where robots start the game hanging. Uh, Danny, what, what's your impressions on uh, on that as well, that you actually start hanging? Yeah, that was one of the, the really cool parts. Um, that was part of how we tried to not only just build a game that was themed around space, but a game that sort of followed a, a space mission. So if you were really going to uh, an asteroid or something to, to go mine or, or go pull resources out of it, or just to go explore, um, your, your rover would have to get there by you know a lander or some other vehicle. Rovers don't just show up on the moon or Mars you know, you know, like they are. So they got to get there somehow. So being able to start from the lander was all about being able to look at, you know, this game as a, a space mission um, and, and really kind of go the, the full treatment um, and, and build in a lot of that realism, a lot of that, you know, real world, how it would happen. Yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting to see because I'm excited to see if some teams will just like jump down and not really worry about the robot as much or mm -hmm. people will lower down gracefully or whatever. I would just belly flop personally. <laughs> it's only four inches. It's not that yeah. big of a deal. So the second way you can score points is by claiming your depot using your team marker. So team markers are cool because you could make them however you want. They can be individual for your team, which is also unique this year. So a lot of new things. That'll land you 15 points. Uh, it's a pretty, it's a really simple auto objective and it's kind of similar to the jewels last year. So the most difficult scoring objective this year is sampling. This is done by knocking the gold mineral off its starting position on the playing field four, and that'll earn your alliance 25 points. An important note relating to sampling is there aren't any rules, let's see, stopping one robot from doing both samples for an alliance. So it's very possibly a good strategy for a team to program both a single and a double sample auto so they can work with basically anyone they come up with. Um, some interesting ways that I've seen teams look at scoring the samples is with CV computer vision off of a webcam or off of a phone camera, or using some weird color sensors on arms, which sounds crazy to me, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, both those options seem crazy to me. I am not a programmer, so. Uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Danny. Oh, I was going to say, um, the team should really take a look at what um, software tools are, are available, what comes in the, the current um, SDK. There's like the, the Vuforia instruments um, for, you know, software within the phones um, for looking at the field navigation targets. Um, and I, I'm, I don't know if there's stuff for identifying game balls, uh, the, the silver versus the gold, uh, the cubes. Um, but there might be some of that uh, things in there. So, so definitely try to take a look at the resources that are already available and the stuff that's already been done. Um, you know, they, they say, right, science engineering is, is standing on the shoulders of giants. So, so definitely take advantage of the stuff that's already out there. And finally, uh, you can score points uh, by parking uh, in the crater. Uh, you know, Ethan, when we did the uh, robot in one weekend, there was a lot of cool experiments going on with what kind of wheels uh, worked well with that. So another thing to note, though, is that uh, parking only requires you to be in the crater, not completely. And can you can you explain a little bit more about that, Ethan? Yeah, so the rules for completely within versus within in the FTC game manual is basically you're you're in an area if you're breaking the infinitely tall vertical plane on the outside border of that area, which sounds really complicated, but basically you just have, have to have something extending over into that area. So if you had, like, an arm, you could just fold down inside of the crater that would earn you those points. Um, alternatively, there are some parts of the game manual that require you to be completely within. 
and that would require no part of your robot to be breaking the vertical plane that defines the limit having your robot inside the area so many different situations personally i blame danny but (laughs) danny wrote the entire manual right by myself in a weekend (laughs) (laughs) yeah so what do you guys think about the auto portion of the game i i honestly really like how it's it's not weighted super high like some games, but it's all you also need to do it. Danny, go um, ahead. Yeah, I, I think the the claim markers are uh, a really cool you know sort of new addition to the FTC um, sort of game environment. We we haven't had something where um, you know a, a team brings sort of part of the field and. Um, typically, you know, there's serious rules about detaching parts of your robot intentionally. Um, and and that's always been a big issue. And now there's a whole part of autonomous mode, a whole chunk of the game developed around leaving something that you brought with you mm-hmm. to the field um, and, and delivering that for, for a bonus and, and something that lasts not just from auto mode, but all the way across, you know, the entire um, chunk of the game. So I think that's something cool. Um, it's it was actually here's a fun uh, fun fact it was actually something that was talked about and considered for um relic recovery at one point you know there was an idea that the relic was going to be something that teams brought to the field uh themselves and that was going to be part um and and for that was a while back but for one reason or another we ended up deciding on on making a relic um you know for the game and, and to be a part of the field but that was sort of an idea that was scrapped for relic recovery, but then reintroduced in uh, Rover Ruckus here. So one of the things that GDC is pretty good at is is never letting a good idea die and, and always kind of keeping it and letting it uh, letting it come back. That's a cool point, and that, that's kind of cool to hear that it uh, it kind of just stays in the pipeline always, right? Um, so uh, some of the questions, by the way, we'll take some questions now, uh, a few later as it kind of goes on with the segment. But uh, one I wanted to catch us, uh, by the way, uh, Meg Flake said he was uh, betrayed because Dozer wasn't in. Uh, the meta or the animation um, or the meta itself. Uh, but more importantly, uh, Big Boy asks, um, are you allowed to push the balls and cubes out of the containing area that they're in? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> assuming he means the crater, that would be yes. Um, if you, Yeah, I'm assuming the crater. Be, I'm not sure how you would push them out. Yes. <laughs> yep. And keep in mind, guys, any answers we give are not official, so make sure you uh, you go to the official channels for something like that. The best we can do is uh, make educated guesses, uh, or in some cases, if it's my case, just a guess in general. <laughs> um, yeah, so, as far as I know, that should be legal. Yeah. Uh, Ethan, or Nathan, I, I was going to say, or Ethan, man, man, I'm confusing you two now. Um, I was going to say, I know uh, Nathan couldn't make it today, but he did leave a, a couple thoughts that he had as well, too, uh, for the game. Is there is there a couple that you had in mind they kind of want to uh, one of the highlighter talk about? Yeah. Um, so his first point was there are a ton of ways to approach auto this year. Um, there are four different scoring objectives that can be accomplished. And something that I'd like to build on that is it's it'll be a tough year to plan around your alliance partner. Mm-hmm. If you're both doing a sample and a team marker, like have making sure your robots don't hit each other is going to be a challenge this year. Um just be, even if that wasn't a challenge, I've, I don't think that's really been a challenge in the past, but making sure you can program your autonomous is around the other robot and having a ton of different options you can run will be really interesting. Yeah, I think especially once you get to the world championship, because there, it's kind of that interesting thing with the levels, right? Because if you're at a, like a, a, a qualifier or something like that, you know, if your robot does everything in auto, you're, you're, you're going to win anyways, right? You don't need to worry about your alliance partner too much. Uh, but with the Super Regionals being gone and going out to World Championships, that's uh, teams that are going to the World Championships are going to be very cognizant about uh, how they program their autos to work with multiple different alliance partners as well. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. So he also had a point. Sampling is something that is pretty hard, but it should be worth it if you can do it very quickly. Um, the biggest thing to ensure when you're sampling is that you don't cross back over that row and hit any of the other sil- any of the silver minerals because those are vaults and those roll super easily. Hmm. So, Danny, can you talk a little bit about the uh, the game pieces and kind of the decision because they're they're both kind of familiar looking, right? The previous years. Uh, so, yeah. what was kind of the, some of the decision behind using those game pieces? So, you know the. The game design committee, which is a, a larger group, you know, it's a, a group of you know volunteers. Um, you know, they they look at you know a lot of different things, 
and and it's it is this game is a a really really multifaceted sort of engineering challenge. There's there's a lot of different things: timing, scheduling, um, you know, quality, consistency, um, but also cost. Um, and so there, there's a lot of different things that, that play into account. Um, so game pieces that are that have been used before, um, you know, tend to have a, a lower cost, um, and there's some uh, community familiarity there. Um, so if we have a known game piece, then we can push in some other directions, and we can try to go a little bit more significant. Um, you know, not that you really want challenges to build one year to the next, but um, you don't have to go all the way back to square one. You can, you know, sort of say, well. There's, there's a lot of match footage, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of experience around picking up this ball and this cube. Um, and so we can, you know, kind of keep playing with those things. Um, and so th there's just sort of a lot of, you know, back and forth that happens there and, and a lot of different, you know, things that happen. Um, you know, we, we go through, we trial a ton of different game pieces. Um, you know, we, we have a couple of vendors, you know, that we really, really like. Um, we, when we first sought after, you know, a wiffle ball, you know, for, you know, games you know, many years ago, we went and looked at a ton. We sampled a, a you know, really wide variety and, and came to this one for its durability. Um, the cube has been something that dates back to the 2013 game. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, now we have those cubes all over the place. There's a lot of people out there in the community that have those cubes. And what is it the exact were, same piece as before? Okay. It, well, okay, so I got to ask. So, the, you know, in FRC, I know you guys had a lot of fuel left over. Uh, is this like Andy Mark just has tons of pieces left over from 2013 and needs to sell them at low, low prices? No, we, we've gotten pretty good. Um, this is our, our fourth game, fourth, fifth game, uh, something like that. All right. um, and so we've gotten pretty good at predicting how many, you know, field sales we're going to have. Um, so we tend to not have a ton of game pieces um, left over. Um, that cube in particular is actually manufactured in Kokomo, um, in, in, in Indiana, where Andy Mark is from. So that's something that we're really proud of. Cool. Um, when we need more of them, we call up the molder and we get another batch of a thousand, you know, a couple days from now. So our lead times are incredibly short. So that cube in particular, we're able to keep a really, you know, a somewhat smaller, uh, quantity in house and somewhat a smaller inventory. Um, but one of the things we were able to do by having by recycling a game piece is we're able to sell the field without those game pieces in it. And so for all the people who still have them, we're able to save them a bunch of money. Um, and as cost conscious as everything is, if we can pull out some costs from the field, reuse some game pieces, you know, that's something that is uh, really attractive. So let's move on uh, to uh, Teleop as we go through. So uh, Teleop portion of the game, uh, of course, the biggest chunk, I, I find ironic that's the shortest part of the game animation that they show, but uh, there's uh, two two ways to uh, score points in driver controlled in uh, scoring minerals, uh, either to the floor goal or the depot uh, or into the cargo hold of the lander. Uh, so depot, depot minerals are worth two points each and minerals scored into the correct cargo hold are worth five points each. Now, with the layout uh, of points in this game, an alliance can score, well, theoretically 260 points with a full auto and two hangs in endgame, which makes a full auto and endgame robot viable during early season for qualifiers. And we talked a little about that before, that, you know, after that, really competitive robots, they're going to have to start picking up minerals and scoring mechanisms uh, to keep up to be the captain of the first pick in most regions, uh, in my opinion, Ethan. Yeah, for sure. Um, and something kind of we can pull back to auto, um, something I forgot to mention, if you get both of your alliances, um, both of your alliances team markers into the depot, you claim that depot. So that means that the other alliance cannot descore any objects from that. So that's kind of another callback to rescue. Um, in rescue, you could descore objects from the floor goal. You can do that again this year, as long as it doesn't have both of an alliance's team markers in it. So that's another layer of importance in the auto period, which is really interesting. Yeah. So, so just, yeah. let's see. You can go. Uh, I was just going to uh, follow up saying that, you know, deciding where to score minerals will depend a lot on how, how confident a team is, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. Like, I knew we were a more slightly inexperienced team. I think getting a good auto and a consistent end game down will treat you a lot better during the early season than having a sketchy cargo hold mineral score. Um, and really, there's a, there's a huge market for second picks at state championships that are just really consistent auto and end game bots. 
Um, a plus there would be the ability to score in the depot during tally off, just as something to do during the rest of the game. Um, if your plan is to be a winning captain or first pick past probably December or Feb January, you really want to have your mineral store down. And if you do choose to cycle minerals, we do have a handy little chart made up by Zach from Rorocracy that helps break down how cycle times impact points scored. So can you explain what's on here a little bit and kind of break that down? Yeah, for sure. So it talks about where you're scoring points. So obviously in the depot is worth less. So your cycles are going to be taking more time to score the same amount of points. It also talks about what your cycles are made up of. So if you're only cycling one mineral, you're going to score a little less points. So this has an estimate on the bottom on the horizontal axis. You have the, the time it takes for your cycle to complete. And on the, the vertical axis, you have the amount of points you can score. So if you're scoring 10 points per cycle, you're sorting your minerals before you dump them, and then you are putting them in the correct zone, you can score, what is that, like 125 points if you have an eight-second cycle, which is really, mm. I think, a reasonable thing to do. So making sure you're looking at that strategy and saying, okay, we can realistically only cycle in 15 seconds. Maybe we shouldn't be looking at Telia. Maybe we should be focusing our focusing our efforts on to end game or autonomous. So, so Danny, when you guys look at uh, the teleop mode uh, in this game in, in particular, uh, do you look at things in regards to like, you know, how scoring is going to, I'm assuming you do, you kind of want to balance scoring uh, area, right? So do you look at things like, you know, we think it's going to take this long for a good team to cycle or anything like that? Yeah, we, we try to. Um, it is That is one of the hardest parts about sort of game design and trying to weigh one thing over another, um, you know, and, and how do we address what, how many points is each thing worth and, and all of those different factors, trying to weigh those back and forth. Um, a lot of times sort of the, the best information that we can go on is sort of historical information. How many cubes did um, Relic Recovery robots do? How, you know, what percentage of matches or, or how often did a robot finish early um, and, and could have gone, you know, longer? Um, you know, we, we try to sort of measure and meter things around from, you know, is there parallels from other games, past games, other competitions? Um, you know, does something sort of look like an FRC task? Is there any parallel that we can draw there? Um, it's it is that is one of the more challenging components. Yeah, for sure. And that, it's something that really affects the game and the people's experience of the game too. Making sure everything is balanced kind of properly. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, let's move on to the end game. Of course, then we have some uh, questions for Danny. We want to learn a little bit more about him, uh, and then some questions from the audience. So don't forget to take out first updates now uh, with your question, and we'll get that uh, for Danny as well too. So uh, we talked about the end game a, a little bit already in regards to strategy, but let's run through the ways you can score points during the end game this year. So you can park partially in the crater. That's fifteen points, right? Uh, or completely in it for twenty-five, and you can hang. Uh, which will earn you 50 points as well. Is hanging the right nomenclature for this year's game? It's always different every year. Hang or latch? Yeah, it's latch, I think, technically. Latch? Okay. I, sorry, I always confuse those. Like, every single, because it always changes no matter what program you're in. It's one year it's hang, one year it's climb, one year it's latch. Mm -hmm. Just pick one, Danny. Come on. <laughs> well, sometimes you have to scale a tower, and sometimes you have to climb a scale. All right. So. <laughs> Fair, so fair enough. What, what do you guys think about the hang this year? It's like it's a weird thing that we have to latch onto. Like it's kind of like a literally, drawer, yeah, like a drawer handle or something. What what is it, Danny? Do you know what that that piece? It's is a from? custom made part. It's something that we spec and designed. Um, but it started life as um, oh, going all the way back to some of our early mockups as stuff like a, a U bolt, um, a big I bolt. Um, we found from that that we definitely wanted two points of attachment uh, so that we could, um, we would always know its orientation with respect to the field. If we had just a, an eye bolt with one point, then it, it could spin and that would be different from match to match. So we didn't want that. Um, but in the end there, we, we tried to look for a part off the shelf that would do the job. And there was nothing that gave us a ton of confidence. 
um, and and met the spec and design quite the way that we wanted it to. Hmm. Um, so that, like so many of the other parts, is a is a custom made uh, part just for the lander. Interesting. Yeah, that's 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 pretty cool. Um, that I, I like the custom part. I mean, honestly, you know, it, it's nice to have things you can resource quickly and that sort of thing. But it's cool to have some kind of custom touch to it each year as well, right? Yeah. It looks really spacey, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> spacey, you know? chat. What do you guys think of what? What do you think of the latch? Do you like the look of it? Uh, should it be something else? Where? How are you feeling on that? Um, I, I like Grumpback Will's comment by the way in regards to strategy. He says latching won't win you every match. But it will lose you a finals. That's so true, right? Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna come down to that, where I think you know highly competitive events, you know, back and forth. You're gonna need to be able to latch, uh, both in auto and in uh, in teleop as well. Yeah, no, that's a really really like clean way of saying it too. Absolutely. Because yeah, we've seen tons of games where if you miss a hang or a latch or whatever, you're done. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers, keeping fun loud, live, and independent. Pledge your support. Go to patreon.com forward slash fun FRC.